Ah, we've got Hero has arrived. That's fantastic. So, Paul, we're just going to, um, how are you? Nice to see you all the way over there in Berlin. <laughs> I hope you're well. We're just going to let the um, part attendees enter the webinar now. They're coming in in their drones to see you um, do your demo. Have you had a good weekend so far? Um, we've had a busy weekend. Uh, we've, been, we've been doing a lot of work in the dairy recently. So, yeah, it's been busy. Fantastic. But the weather's nice. It's, um, it's cold, but it's quite sunny. Yeah, same here in the UK. We've had very bright blue skies, but very bitter cold, very April. We thought it would be um, a little bit more um, warmer, but never mind. We'll get there for May when we're all allowed back inside the pubs. <laughs> OK, so I'm going to we're at uh, five o'clock now. And um, so what's the time is it with you? Six or six o'clock? Yeah. OK. Um, and we've got 31 attendees in already. So we'll we'll start. Um, I would like to welcome everybody to this session about an introduction to cheese making with Paul Thomas. Paul Thomas is an Academy of Cheese director, founding director. Um, he is our technical guru. We love him to bits and he helps us out with all the really tricky stuff <laughs> and technical, uh, technical details. And I'm going to hand you over to Paul and I'll, um, I'll answer any questions. I don't know, Paul, can you see the chat the for questions? Yeah, I can. OK, well, if I can't answer them, if well, I'll, I'll interrupt and ask you the questions. But otherwise, I'm going to disappear and hand you over to the wonderful Paul Thomas. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, so uh, I am Paul Thomas. I work as a freelance uh, dairy uh, technical advisor, uh, dairy technologist, helping cheesemakers to develop new recipes, to understand their process and to, um, to generally make great cheese as efficiently as possible. Uh, I'm also a, a cheesemaker myself. Uh, it, during lockdown, uh, I set up a cheesemaking business uh, here in Germany, where I now live. Uh, and as Tracy said, I'm also the Academy of Cheese Technical Director. I was uh, responsible for setting up the, um, the four level training program that we're rolling out to uh, cheese lovers everywhere. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about cheese making and I'm going to introduce some very simple cheese making recipes that you should be able to try at home. And in doing so, I hope to give you a little feel for uh, some of the intricacy, some of the complexity that goes into cheese making without too much technical detail. Though. So the, um, the very first cheese that we're going to make uh, today, and I'm just waiting for a pan of uh, hot milk to be delivered to me. It's a very simple recipe that you would be able to go away. Thank you. Uh, that you would be able to go away and make in your own kitchens with ingredients and tools that you've got uh, to hand quite easily. Um, I have here one pan of milk and I've heated that up, or Eula rather has heated that up, to uh, 90 degrees. This is a very simple cheese recipe. It's made by a process that we refer to as direct acidification. So we're not using any starter cultures here. We're just going to add a quantity of acid into that hot milk and it's going to start precipitating the proteins, uh, principally the casein, which is present in the milk. And we'll be able to strain that off. And uh, at the end, we'll have, uh, we'll have a cheese. So, what I need, I've got about a litre of milk here and I've got some food grade lactic acid, but uh, you would be able to use any other acid, you, um, as long as it's food grade. Uh, you could use citric acid, which you might have if you're into home brewing or if nothing else is available, uh, you could use some vinegar. You would need around about um, between 10 and 25 mils of vinegar 
uh, for a, a one liter pan of milk. I'm going to take my lactic acid. I'm going to put that into the milk. I'm going to stir it around. And in just a moment, I'll bring up another pen. So what I have here, one colander, one pen underneath it to collect the whey, and one bit of cotton draining cloth. I don't know if you can see on the back of the spoon, we have some of the curds that have formed under the action of the acidity and the, uh, the acid that we've just added. I can take this pan and pour it through the colander. Gather up the cloth, give it a bit of a squeeze. It's still quite hot, obviously. When most of the moisture is off, you'll be able to just tie a knot in that little bag of curds that have formed. I'll just open that up for a second so you can see. So what we now have. It's a very simple cheese. This is some paneer. What would I do with that next? Well, I take my cloth, I tie it up, I get a small weight, maybe a, a wooden chopping board with some, some weights on it, possibly some tins or um, a jug of water. And I just use that to help to press out the last of the liquid from the curd. After a couple of hours or so, I should have a fairly solid block of curd. It'll be quite hard, it'll be quite rubbery. And I can cut that. I can use that as the basis for, well, curry dishes. We could add curried spices to it. We could make a, a vegetarian curry with the paneer. It's a very simple recipe. It's something you can try at home. But what does it actually taste of? Well, here we begin to see one of the reasons why quite a lot of cheese recipes actually use a large dose of starter culture. Because paneer doesn't have a great deal of flavor unless, we are, uh, unless we're adding spices to it. It doesn't really taste of very much. For most of the cheeses that are made around the UK and around the rest of the world, rather than using direct acidification as a method of production, it's more likely that we would um, use a small dose of starter culture. And I have some starter culture here to show you. Now, a commercial cheesemaker might go and buy a pack of starter culture that would uh, look a little bit like this. Uh, it's about 10 grams of starter culture in a sachet like that when you buy it, and that would be enough to inoculate around about 500 liters of milk, or possibly more, depending on the recipe that you're following. This is a freeze-dried starter culture, what we call a direct vat inoculation starter. When you open the pack, you have these little granules that look a little bit like that. And we would add that directly into the milk. And this essentially contains all of the lactic acid bacteria that we need when we're cheese making. And they're going to perform one crucial function for us. First of all, they're going to acidify the lactose, the sugar which is present in the milk, and they're going to turn that into lactic acid. In doing so, they're going to give an element of food safety. They're going to make the cheese more acidic than the milk, and that's going to inhibit the, uh, the growth of harmful bacteria. But they're also going to do something during the ripening of the cheese as well. Once the starter cultures have grown, during ripening, we then need them to begin to die off. And depending on the cheese variety, uh, if we've got uh, something like cheddar, 
they might die off over a, about a four month or longer period of time. In some softer cheeses, they might survive for a little bit longer. But as they're dying, their cells will begin to split open and they'll release this cocktail of enzymes contained within them, which will help to break down the proteins present within the, uh, within the curd, within the cheese. And they'll turn that into short peptides, amino acids, the things from which we derive a lot of flavor. They'll also break down the protein to give us textural properties that we would expect for that cheese variety. So most of the cheeses that we know today would be made with a dose of starter culture. Now, if we were to go back about 12,000 years or possibly longer into history to look at the very first cheeses that were ever made, it didn't really need the intervention of a cheesemaker in order to make them. Those very first cheeses would have made themselves. Because if we take milk, which is a fairly neutral substance, it has a pH of approximately 6.6. It's a little bit more acidic than water. If we take that and we allow it to sour naturally with indigenous lactic acid bacteria that would have been present in the milk, and milking hygiene 12,000 years ago was probably very different to what we know today. There would have been a lot of bacteria in the milk and the milk would have soured very quickly. If the acidity within the milk increases by a factor of roughly 100, taking the pH to 4.6, what we call the isoelectric point of milk. Well, at that point, the proteins with, within the milk will begin to undergo a structural change. They begin unfolding and we start to see the formation of a gel. What we have in... <coughs> this glass here is some milk that was warmed up to room temperature yesterday and a very small dose of the starter culture was added to it. And then it was left alone until the pH came down. It reached about 4.6, uh, about three hours ago. And we see we no longer have milk. We have a gel here. We have a small amount of whey on the top, which has come out from the gel. This is how the very first cheese that was ever created in the history of time created itself through natural acidification by lactic acid bacteria which were present in that raw milk. The first cheese maker who came along would have been the person who realized that if we take this high moisture, fairly acidic, but still not very durable product, and we strain it off through some cheesecloth, then we'll end up with a product that is perhaps a little bit more durable that we can store for a period of time. So we bring back the pan. I have another colander, this time lined with some disposable draining cloth. I'm going to pour this curd. Need to give it a little hand out. There we go. Smells a little bit like yogurt and very similar acidity to yogurt. And you see there we have our curds sitting in the draining cloth. And we just leave those to drain off for anywhere between a couple of hours and maybe up to a day, depending on how dry we want those curds to be. A very simple version of this cheese, what we call a, a lactic cheese, where we're relying mainly on the acidification to set the milk, would be something like quark. We have an example here. You would eat that with some fruit for your breakfast in the morning that's drained for a very limited period of time, only about an hour or so, taking around about 10% of the way off, leaving us with a very high moisture product at the end. <clears throat> if we were to hang it and drain it for longer, well, we're gonna take off more moisture and we'd end up with something that was maybe more durable, perhaps even something that we could begin to ripen. And there's plenty of examples of predominantly lactic styles of cheese 
uh, made within the UK, things like uh, Cinnadon Hill, for example, or Ragstone. These were all cheeses that would broadly follow this kind of technology, but were relying on mainly the acidification to set the milk, we drain it off for a period, and then we'll ripen those cheeses using some yeasts on the rind or some molds perhaps, in order to deliver certain flavor properties and an aesthetic appearance to the cheese that we wouldn't have if it was sold as an unripened cheese as the quark is. So this is cheese number two. Essentially a variant of the very first cheese that was ever made in the history of time. But it's still, we can't really make brie like this. We can't make cheddar like this. There's a whole host of different cheese varieties that have very different textural properties to that which we would expect to get in one of these lactic styles of cheese. They tend to make cheeses which are particularly high in moisture, which have a relatively short shelf life. If we wanted to make a cheese which had more elasticity to it, well, we need another ingredient to add to the mix in order to achieve those textural properties. This type of lactic technology will take a period of time in order to reach its target acidity. Uh, at the very least, we'd be looking at about eight hours or so. In many recipes, we might be looking at closer to 24 or in a few cases, even longer than 24 hours in order to reach our target acidity. To make this wide variety of other cheeses, the Breeze, the, uh, the uh, cheddar style cheeses, Cheshire, all of these cheeses, we need another ingredient. That's what we'll move on to now. This next ingredient doesn't really look like very much at the moment. Um, and it doesn't look particularly edible either. This is a bit of dried abomasum. Uh, the abomasum or bell is the fourth stomach compartment uh, from the calf, the kid, or the lamb. There's a lot of stories about uh, some very early cheesemaker who took uh, a kid's stomach bag, normally used as a water carrier, put some milk into it, went for a long ride across the desert, and discovered that they had made cheese in a fraction of the time that would be required through the acidification method alone they discovered rennet. What the rennet does, it contains enzymes, and one key enzyme in particular, something called chymosin. The chymosin is able to break down the casein, the protein in the milk, and causes a structural change to that casein. It cuts off the outer layer of the casein, and all of a sudden the protein is no longer happy floating around freely in the water phase of the milk. It wants to find other caseins to bind to, and in doing so will form a gel, will form a curd. Very similar to the curds that we saw with the lactic cheese, but perhaps with more elasticity associated with it. And crucially, it would form in a fraction of the time. Now there are still some cheesemakers around the world who will use a piece of abomasum like this, they'll tear off a strip and they'll maybe make that up in a solution of hot whey from a previous day's cheese make. And that will become their starter culture and their rennet, uh, which will both acidify and set the curd on specific cheese recipes. There's some Alpine style cheese that are still made like that. More commonly though, these days, a cheese maker might obtain some rennet through a, from a cheese making supply company, and it will be present at a standard strength. The strength of the rennet has been standardized, so the cheese maker can expect the same kind of set every time they go to make cheese. We don't really see that with the, the dried abomasum. We might have slightly different strengths of the rennet from one day to the next when we're using it. It's possible to get animal rennet. Uh, which has been extracted from an abomasum. It's also possible to get vegetarian alternatives to that animal rennet, which are increasing in popularity. There's a lot of cheese makers now who are using uh, vegetarian rennets as opposed to animal rennets. 
the reason why vegetarian rennet was first invented, well, for all of the milk that is processed around the world each year, there just aren't enough animal stomachs to set all of that milk. So we had to invent a vegetarian alternative uh, to the animal rennet uh, in order to, to process all the milk that we process. Whether we're using vegetarian or animal rennet, it will effectively perform a similar or perhaps even exactly the same function during cheese making. I've got a bottle of milk here. I've had this sitting in a pan full of some water, hot water, in order to bring the temperature up. It feels a little bit warmer than hand temperature, so I know that it's roughly at the right temperature. And I'm going to take a 0.1 mil sample of the rennet. I'm going to add that to the milk, shake it up briefly, and I'm going to leave that for a few minutes and we'll see what happens there. What the rennet is now doing, it's starting to attack that outer layer of the casing, the ends of the kappa casing. The protein is going to begin to form into a gel, this kind of milky jelly, in which all of the fat and the water from the milk are entrapped. When the cheesemaker reaches the, the right degree of firmness in the gel, and that would very much depend on the kind of recipe that they were following. If we were making hard cheese, we would leave the curd to set for a relatively short period of time. And we'd cut the curd quite early. Softer curds tend to give us firmer cheeses because they give up their moisture much more readily. If we wanted to make uh, a soft cheese though, we'd need quite hard or firm curds at the point that we cut them. So we'd leave it for longer, possibly an hour, possibly an hour and a half. Which then brings us to the next Blue Peter uh, model here. I have a pan of milk, some starter culture went into that um, about three hours ago, and some rennet went into that just over an hour and a half ago. And you can see that it started to set into a gel. And what I now need, some cheese molds. If you're making cheese at home, of course, you don't really need to go out and buy cheese molds. You probably need to go out and buy some, uh, some rennet and some starter cultures. But you could easily make something like this using some uh, some plastic containers or even plastic colanders lined with some drainage cloth. Here we've got some blue disposable ch uh, cheesecloth, which is used by quite a lot of cheesemakers. A strip of cotton would also do. So I'm going to line the cheese moulds with the cloth. Try and neaten out the folds a little bit. I have another mould just here. One ladle. And you'll see there we have a ladle full of curd which I will start to place into vegetables. This is essentially a very simple recipe, uh, an unripened curd cheese called colic. It's something that was traditionally associated with some of the farmhouse Stilton dairies. A soft cheese, some acidification, relatively high dose of rennet. And here, by high dose, we're talking about something like 0.3 uh, mils of rennet for every liter of milk. That sets the curd over about a two hour period. I've got these curds which I can begin to label into the cheese mold. Thank you. 
And you see now, we have whey beginning to leak out the bottom. There's a lot of moisture trapped within these cheeses. Uh, we'll leave them to drain for around about 12 to 24 hours. With this particular recipe, we don't actually turn the cheeses in the moulds, which uh, is fairly common to a lot of soft cheese recipes. If you want even sides, uh, you want both sides to look exactly the same, we would turn those cheeses a couple of times, maybe after the first hour or so, when the curd is firm enough to handle, you might flip them over and put them back the other way into the cheese mould. We're not going to do that with this particular recipe, for reasons I'll show you in just a moment. What we will find though is that the curd will drain down normally roughly to about a third of its initial height. As it drains, we'll start to fold the edges of the bag over you know, the edges of the cheesecloth over the top of the curd. And in doing so, we're going to create this little bowl shaped depression in the top of the cheese, which is uh, fairly characteristic of colic. Uh, historically, Colic would have been eaten with uh, some fresh fruit in the top of this basket shaped depression in the finished cheese. And once again, in true Blue Peter style, we go across to the cheeses that we made just the other day. We have here this little bowl shaped depression. I cut it. You'll be able to see it in cross section, just like that. We could fill that with some fruit. Uh, at this time of year, maybe some uh, rhubarb, uh, just done quite simply to two or three centimeter lengths, and put into a pan with a bit of sugar to pull out some of the juices. Cook for a very short period of time to maintain the, the shape and the structure of the, the rhubarb. And then we just put that on the top and serve that a kind of nice, cheesy pudding, almost like a, a rhubarb cheesecake, but without all of the effort and the hard work. So we've made some paneer. Uh, that we made through direct acidification of the milk. We made some very simple lactic curd, just by taking the milk, adding some starter culture, and leaving that to acidify until the pH came down to 4.6. That's very easy to see. You don't even need a pH meter to be able to see that. If the milk hasn't acidified, it won't set into a curd. The Rennet set cheeses, we perhaps do need to measure the acidity, uh, particularly with things like uh, mozzarella, for example. And there, if we're wanting to melt and stretch the curds, those melting and stretching properties are highly dependent on the degree of acidity that's being produced within the curd. We need a pH, not a 4.6 there, but a 5.2. And if we miss that, we're not going to be able to make mozzarella that melts and stretches. So a lot of amateur cheesemakers might invest in a, a cheap pH meter like this, essentially a little electrode. You stick that into the milk or the curd, that'll tell you what acidity has been developed by the bacteria. So we've maybe got some initial signs of setting just on the surface there. By no means completely set here, but there is something of a change in the viscosity of the milk on the surface. We would expect, having relative milk, that normally within around about 10 to 20 minutes, we might begin to see the first signs that the set was taking place. It happens quite quickly at higher temperatures. It happens relatively slow, uh, slowly at cooler temperatures, down to about 18 to 20 degrees. And any lower than 18 to 20 degrees, we just won't see any set at all. So a lot of the cheese making processes that are carried out by cheesemakers all across the world, including in the UK, are carried out in rooms that are actually quite warm. A lot of these processes will be uh, happening somewhere between 20 degrees and about 40 degrees. In fact, some of the very best cheeses are actually made not in a cold room, but in a room that is just a little bit too warm for the cheesemaker. Now, some of these recipes you'll be able to find in my book. You should be able to get hold of that, Homemade Cheese by Paul Thomas, uh, which is published by Lawrence Books. Uh, and uh, 
lots of recipes in there for the paneer, for uh, lactic curds, and some of the more complex recipes, the breeze, the cheddars, the washed rind tubers. But I hope this has been an interesting introduction uh, to a very simple end of cheese making with some simple recipes that you can try at home. Thank you. Been brilliant. Thank you, Paul. Really, really good. We've just got a couple of questions. I've managed to answer most of them. Um, we one question was what we said about the starter cultures where they could get small quantities, and I've replied about the um, and Rennet that you can get these homemade cheese making kits, can't you? Yeah. And there's, there's companies like uh, cheesemakingshop.co.uk. That's or, who I put up uh, for your book. Yeah. Um, would all be able to supply them, uh, small quantities for amateur cheesemakers or smallholders. And then what about the milk? What's what would you recommend milk as the milk? Get is, organic or yeah. um, organic doesn't necessarily improve the coagulation properties of the milk. One thing we do see with supermarket milk because it's typically pasteurized at a slightly higher temperature, it can, it doesn't always set as well as milk that is either pasteurized at the uh, minimum time temperature combination guaranteed to, uh, required to guarantee for safety, or raw milk, and raw milk sets very well. Um, but with raw milk, you wouldn't just knock on the door of any old farm and ask to, to get some raw milk from them you really would want to be buying raw milk from a, a dairy that was also licensed for retail sale of raw drinking milk. But if you were walking into a supermarket, what would you get? Whole milk, just regular whole milk? Regular whole milk, but it doesn't, doesn't always set that well. In fact, one of the best places that I would suggest to go and buy milk, a lot of on-farm pasteurizers tend to stick pretty close to the minimum time temperature combination required to guarantee safety. And that doesn't affect the coagulation properties quite as much as over pasteurizing the milk. Um, so generally getting milk from a, a small on-farm pasteurizer, it's going to have better cheese making properties. Okay, so go and chat up your local farmer then really. I mean, I had a go, I tested a load of kits for the Guild of Fine Food for Fine, Di Fine Food for Digest and I just used regular whole milk from the supermarket and it was great. It, it gave me the... It wasn't brilliant, but it gave me the insight on how to make it and uh, and 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 to do it at home, like you say, with all yeah. your kitchen equipment, which is fantastic. Yeah, and the, the paneer recipe, you know, because you're relying yeah. on precipitation, you're not setting this very delicate curds that does require really good quality milk. Um, you can set any milk through the direct acidification method, so you can make paneer with with any milk you like really. And the temperatures there that you're going to, 90 degrees. Yeah, it's gonna- if you were using raw milk there, if there was anything present in the raw milk, then it's gonna be killed off by the yeah. temperature that you're going to. So. Just very, very quickly, we've got another one, sorry, to before you skid a ladle off. Thank, um, thank you, very interesting, is Catherine saying, how would sheep milk, sheep's milk behave differently to cows? Uh, sheep's milk has high levels of fat and protein. The high level of protein causes the milk to set a lot faster than we see in cow's milk. The high levels of fat sometimes can slow down the drainage, which in some cases can give us problems in soft cheese production, it just hangs on to too much moisture. I see there was another question there about unhomogenized milk. Yes. Really, homogenization shouldn't significantly affect the, um, the cheese making properties of the milk, but Generally, and where milk has been homogenized, if it's being bought in the supermarket, it's probably been pasteurized to a higher time temperature combination anyway, and that can affect the cheese making properties of the milk. Um, homogenization isn't so much a, a bearing on whether the milk is going to set well or not, which brings me to one final point. Oh. <laughs> That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, take care over there in Berlin and lovely to see you. And thank you to everybody for joining. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.